Changeling's sick joke. 12 hours. 12 fucking hours straight of driving. The sun set three hours ago, making these dirt roads even more treacherous. The tank is getting low. My eyes are heavy as hell. But is it safe to stop yet? I can feel my empty stomach cramping. My mind is starting to panic again. I glance over to the passenger seat to get a bit of my composure back. Mickey, my little angel. She's curled up in the seat, wrapped in a blanket, sleeping softly. The cut on her cheek still seems angry, but it's human. And she's still cradling that shotgun like it's a stuffed toy. Why? Why does this have to be happening? She never heard a fly in her life. And, and now she has to keep that thing close. Running for our lives like this. What kind of sick joke is this? What did we deserve? What did we do to deserve this shit? Why? I hear Nikki cry out as the car starts to swerve. Having drifted off, this startles me awake and quickly steady the wheel, stopping us from ending up in a ditch. Babe, you need to rest. Let me take the wheel, she hurriedly says, gripping my hand. Wouldn't be much point at this rate. We're running on fumes. I... I don't know. I... I don't know if we're far enough to be safe. I managed to say between yawns. We... We can't stop the car and get stranded out here in the middle of the woods. I... Nikki tries to object, but can't seem to find the words. I'm fine, babe. Just... Just keep, just help me stay awake and keep an eye out for, for like a, a place to stop. She says, pointing towards a medium sized cabin on the side of the road. Her voice seems about as surprised the luck as I am. I can't help but feel pessimistic about this good fortune. No way is this going to turn out well, right? Though, knowing our options, I turn to the place's driveway. An automatic light suddenly brightens the area near the garage. It's a two-story house with an old-fashioned log design, rustic and beautiful. There are a few larger windows on the second floor than any I see in, on the bottom. The lights are on, so we assume the owners are at home. Excuse me. We get out of the van, grabbing our hastily packed bags, pretty much all we have left. Nikki leaves her shotgun to not scare the owners while I keep my 45 in my belt holster and a spare in my bag along with spare magazines, just in case. We quickly walk up to the front door, keeping an eye out on the woods. Nikki knocks while I keep looking around. After a moment, the door is opened by a middle-aged woman with a concerned expression on her face, no doubt due to the very late night knock at the door. Sorry to bother you, ma'am. My friend and I were taking a road trip, and we were kind of dumb and managed to run out of gas. Could you put us, or could you point us to a place where we could fill up and get some rest and eat, please? Nikki says fairly quickly, being an extrovert. I really don't know what my antisocial ass would do without her in this situation. Oh, here. The lady says in a soft, concerned voice. That's a shame. Well, we don't get many visitors, so you are more than welcome to stay the night. Come on in. I can get you girls some warm drinks and something to eat. My man can show you to the nearest gas station in the morning. She smiles warmly as she opens the door wider, gesturing us in. We can see a middle-aged man in a recliner in the front of the TV who is getting up seemingly to welcome us in as well. Nikki looks back at me with hesitancy. We're both a bit wary of such a spontaneous amount of generosity, but we don't have much choice given the situation. Thank you so much. You don't have to do this for us. I, it, it wouldn't be an inconvenience, would it? Nikki says gratefully, turning on her heel. Nonsense. You're more than welcome, young ladies. 
the man says, patting both our shoulders as we walk in. After all we've been through, it is almost unsettling for me to treat, be treated so kindly by a stranger. And I imagine Nikki feels much the same, though she's better at hiding it than me. We're encouraged to sit down on the couch in the living room. What looks to be a foreign romance film has been paused on the TV. He, says, he sits back down in his recliner to the right of the couch as the woman moves towards the kitchen. You girls allergic to anything? She calls out from the adjacent room, both of us replying to the contrary. So then, what are your names? The man says calmly as if to avoid startling a wild animal. I'm Ronald, and my wife in there is Margaret. I'm Nikki, and my friend is Sophie. Nikki goes on, beginning to exchange and small talk with them. While they chat, I slowly observe the house just in case things turn sour. The living room has a high ceiling with a chandelier hanging down about five feet above us. Behind us, I see some stairs going up, as well as an open door that seems to lead downstairs into the basement. To the left of that is a hallway, the same one that Margaret had walked down to enter the kitchen. Everything seems fairly homely, so I start to let my hackles down. Is something the matter there, Miss Sophie? And come to think of it, Nikki, why do you have that cut on your cheek? Looks painful, Ronald says worriedly. Oh, I, uh, I was just looking around. You have a lovely home, sir. I say fairly quickly back, hoping to be convincing enough to avoid suspicion. Though, he probably was just consumed. Sophie isn't the best with strangers and new things. I, I practically had to kidnap her to get her out on this trip with me. As for the cut, I fell down a short flight of stairs earlier today. It isn't as bad as it might look. Nikki responds jovially, elbowing my side. How she can so easily come up with a fictitious backstory is beyond me. Well, I'm going to think that it's more twisting of the truth than anything. Ronald lets out a hearty laugh alongside Nikki's fake chuckling. The more I hear her talk, the more I can tell how anxious she is. Though you wouldn't be able to tell if you didn't know her as I do. Every fiber is my be every fiber of my being is telling me to hug her and comfort her, hold her hand and kiss her, but no, not here. We can't. We have to be careful. If those things show up now, I don't think we could get away. Let alone if these two these two are No. I can't think like this right now. Giving myself a panic attack won't help any. I've had a few friends like that in my life. It's always good to explore and push your boundaries. Either way, thank you. This house has been in my family for three generations. I had to renovate it a bit for me and the missus, but I think it turned out well, he says, looking up at the ceiling. It does feel a bit empty at times, though. We just have all grown up and we're rarely getting visitors, so for me it is quite a gift to have something unexpected happen like this. What did I tell you, girls? You can feel at home here, Margaret's voice chimes out from my left. She sets two sandwiches and two mugs of hot tea on the coffee table in front of us, before sitting down in a chair just to the left of the couch. We both give our thanks to Margaret before digging in. I feel my stomach rumble as the first bite of food for half a day enters it. Even if this sandwich wasn't incredible on its own, it still tastes like enclosure to me. Judging by how quickly Nikki goes through hers, she more than agrees. Both her sandwich and her tea are gone in a matter of three or four minutes while I try to take my time in mine. While I try to take my time with mine. That was so good. Thank you so much, Nikki says ecstatically, stretching her arms above her head. You're very welcome. Margaret replies with a wide smile. So, you girls said you're on a road trip, right? Where are you headed? Well, it was kind of a last minute thing, in all honesty. We didn't really leave with a destination in mind, just decided to hit the road and see where it takes us. 
Nikki chirps back with some more half-truths while I continue savoring my meal. Ah, just adventuring for the sake of it. That takes me back. Ronald replies with a sigh. Me and some old buddies fresh out of high school did that. Just piled in a van and went across the country for a week or so. Went from Louisiana to D.C., Long Island to Mount Rushmore. Just singing all the songs that came on the radio and seeing as much of this beautiful country as we could. He goes on for a bit while Margaret continues the Sudoku puzzle she had been working on before we showed up. Maybe another 10 minutes go by before I finish my sandwich and partially my sandwich, partially because I found myself getting absorbed in Ronald's stories. I place the plate back down and pick up my mug of tea and start sipping at it for just a bit. For just a few moments, I... I've been able to forget about all the fucked up shit lately. Nikki seems to be in the same state, starting to truly relax for the first time in hours. Ronald pauses his story in response to Nikki letting out a long yawn. Oh, where are my manners? You girls must be getting real tired. It's getting pretty late, ain't it? I shouldn't keep you two up with this, he says, standing up with a grumble. I suppose so. What time is it? Nikki jumps to attention, reaching reaching into her pocket to pull out her phone. However, it slips from her grasp, landing face down on the ground. Ronald bends over to pick it up, discovering that the lock screen had become visible. Oh, thanks, Nikki says, snatching it back with a nervous and scared tone. She goes to put it back in her pocket, but is stopped. Ronald grips her wrist tightly and pulls her hand out. Seeing this, I instinctively reach my hand toward my holster. Please. Please, may this just be paranoia. Please, not after all this good fortune and hospitality. It feels like... It feels like minutes pass as the screen becomes visible. And my gut's fear is realized. Nikki forgot to change her lock screen background. It's an image of Nikki and me from our first anniversary, a breathtaking view from the boardwalk of a shore house amusement park, or a shoreside amusement park, with Nikki and I kissing. Of course, a fucking course that memory has to be tainted like this. Again, it feels like minutes on end as we all collectively stare at the screen. I feel every bead of sweat stream down my face, and I can hear that sickeningly familiar sound, a slow, blood-curdling crunching and tearing fills the room from both sides. All the while, the sickening stench of decay assaults my nose. I slowly disable the safety on my pistol while gripping my mug off, while gripping my mug. Hard enough, I feel I could break it. I can see Ronald's hand tighten around Nikki's wrist, his fingers and arm twitching wildly. Both his and Margaret's breathing starts to sound labored, as if gasping for air. Why? Why does it always end up like this? Why can't we just be free? Why? What did we do to deserve this sick joke playing on repeat over and over again? Why? My thoughts are interrupted by a raspy, gnarled voice behind me. Before that accursed word is finished, I swing the mug as hard as I can, smashing it into Margaret. A shrill scream pierces my ears along with Nikki's own crying fear. In a blur, I draw my pistol, aiming for Ronald's head. And at that moment, I get a good look at what he is. Bulging, glazed-over eyes. Bloodshot, manic. His cheeks are concave, his nose shrunken, his lips all but non-existent, and his mangled teeth gnashy. His body is contorted and emaciated, like a rag doll fresh out of the dryer. 
The chairman. His distorted voice screams out as he shoots his mangled, elongated hand toward me. And then, like every time before, no matter its face, no matter who it was before this point, I do what I have to for myself and for Nikki. The deafening sound of my pistol fire drowns out his hate-filled screech. It takes two shots through its face before it stumbles, and another three before it lets Nikki go and simply rides on the floor. The fine carpet, the homely seating, this beautiful living room, are all stained with the resent-filled black and sludge-like blood that pours out of its wounds. I grit my teeth as I feel my tears starting to stream down my face, and my stomach twists and cramps. Before I can turn to deal with the other one, however, I'm flung across the room, losing my grip on my gun and having the wind knocked out of me. I hear Nikki scream out my name. The mangled thing that flung me, whatever Margaret is now, crawls on all fours and is on me within half a second, gripping my throat. It's much the same as the first, save for the long hair and thicker nails that start to dig into my skin. Its gnashing teeth and frenzied gaze come within a foot of my face, screeching jumbled syllables approaching the words Sodom and Sinner. I push back on its face with my hands but can barely fight its strength. It bites my left hand in response, tightening its grip and sending saliva spraying across my face with its hate-filled rambling. I feel my arms fall away from its face and my vision becomes blurred before another shot rings out. I gasp for air and roll away from the thing as it falls to the floor, writhing. I hear Nikki unload the remainder of my pistol's magazine into its head and neck. I cough several times before I feel my senses return to me, and I can hear Nikki sobbing beside me. Soph, please, Soph, be okay, she says, gripping my hand and holding out my canteen that was attached to my bag. Her clothes and hands were covered in the, those things putrid blood. I, I... I'm fine, babe. It's all right. Thank, thank you. I stutter out before taking the canteen and taking a long chug. Thank you, I say as I pull her close and hug her. We are both trembling from the adrenaline and shock. We cling to each other for what feels like minutes, letting both our heart rates settle. I, I can't take this anymore. They... They were so nice. Why does this keep happening? Why can't why can't we just be over with this? Nikki says between sobbing breaths. What did we do? What did we do to deserve this shit? We didn't do anything wrong, babe, I say after a moment's pause. It's it's not our fault. We have to do this. What are we supposed to do? This, this life is nothing but pain right now, but, but we have to try to see the end of it. We have to. I don't know if I'm trying to comfort her, myself, both probably. We take a bit to calm down, but we never get a break. Our small moment of peace is shattered by that sound we both know too well. A shrill screech from the woods outside, followed by another and another until there is an unearthly chorus descending upon the house, their twisted gospel music dripping with hate and anger. We both stand, grabbing our bags. I hand Nikki the pistol from my bag while I reload my own. I take a moment to look down at the shrilled husks on the floor, Ronald and Margaret. Such kind-hearted people, reduced to such horrid shells of what they had been. What a sick joke. We open the door before Nikki screams out. Looking outside, there are tens of them, stumbling out of the trees. Some on all fours, some trailing elongated arms behind them. 
some having their heads dangle upside down from limp necks, all of them chanting mantras of loathsome words. Sinner, sodomite, reprobate, degenerate, groomer, and on and on. Upon noticing this, they all let out ear-splitting shrieks or screeches and charge for us. I fire off a couple rounds to no avail before slamming the door shut just in time for one of them to smash head first into it. They smash their distorted faces and hands through the windows, gnashing and grabbing at us. We both fire off more rounds from the guns, but we hear glass breaking and wood cracking from all around us. So, what? What do we do? I hear Nikki cry out desperately. My mind races, hearing some of them breaking through the windows upstairs and loud, heavy thuds before one of the monsters come careening down the flight of stairs. We both jump out of the way fast enough to avoid getting hit, and it smashes over the couch, flailing to get its bearings before charging us again. I fire three shots, and Nikki fires the rest of hers before it slumps over, letting out one final gasping sting. <laughs> I look around the room before remembering the basement. Downstairs, now, I yell out, pointing towards the entrance. I unload the rest of my magazine into one that, into one that I notice at the top of the second floor stairs. It sprints down, grabbing onto my bag and ripping it away from me before I'm able to follow her downstairs. Or down. I shut the heavy door or the heavy wood door, and call out, Find something to block the door with! More crashing and glass breaking comes from upstairs as I feel heavy thuds at the door to my back. A loud, scraping sound comes from the dimly lit basement as Nikki pushes an old desk toward the stairs. I run down to help her. We try to push it up this steep flight together, but before realizing how futile it is, as weak as my sleep-deprived body is. We look at each other, out of breath. My head is splitting, and I feel like I can barely stand. The longer we look, the more obvious it is to both of us, with the breaking and screeching upstairs and the door being hammered on. No more ammunition, and nowhere left to run. Only that deafening, repugnant chorus calling out from above us. I grab her and I pull her onto the back of the dusty, mildew-covered room. We huddle down in the corner furthest from the door. Any of the old, thin windows to, furthest from the door and any of the old, thin windows to the outside. Gripping my head from the pain, I try to think of a way out of this. After all, after all we've suffered through, after all the fighting, this, this can't, this, this is it, isn't it? Nikki whimpers, hugging her knees to her chest. After all the running, the fighting, this is it? She voices my thoughts while looking at me, her feet filled eyes, streaming with tears. My body, sh her body shaking like a leaf. They've taken, they've taken everything from us. And now? I turn to her and grab her, hugging her as tightly as I can. I want to comfort her, tell her everything will be fine. But I can't lie to her. The screams only drone on above. The banging at the door reverberates to our bodies accompanied by the sounds of its wood cracking. I pull away so I can look into her eyes, my own tearing up. They haven't taken everything, and, and they can't. We, we still have each other, right here, right now. They can't take this away from us. They, they can't. I'm interrupted by the ear-splitting sound of them breaking through the basement windows, unable to get in, but making the sound of their hateful cries reverberate through the room even louder. Nikki turns her head away and screams, but 
I put my hands on the cheeks and pull her eyes back. They can't. They won't take us from each other. They can't take what we have between each other. They can't. I try to reassure her as well as myself. A moment passes as I start to question my own reassurance. However, Nikki calms herself a bit and reaches her hand up and grips mine, pulling it off her cheek slightly. Her eyes are red and streaming with tears, but still she smiles and says softly, no, no, they can't. Selfie, she says, leaning in. Selfie, I, I love you. With those words, she closes her eyes, bringing her face up to mine. They, try as they might, truly can't take this from us. My eyes close as I hug her even tighter. Our lips meet. Despite the model, we love each other here and now, even as the door breaks from its hinges. <laughs>